Okay, so good evening and welcome to Digital Talk, an event organized by Omnium Cultural, a Barcelona-based NGO dealing with culture and civil rights. My name is Alex Miquel, and I'm the head of communications of the International Department in Omnium, and I will be moderating this talk. And on our second Digital Talk, we will try to answer a question that many of us are asking with regard to the coronavirus crisis. Is the COVID-19 pandemic being used to weaken democracy and human rights in Europe? To answer this question, we are delighted to have with us experts in the field of human rights and democracy, such as David Kay, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Speech, Sandor Lederer, Director of the Hungarian NGO Kay Monitor, and Renata Avila, International Human Rights and Tech Lawyer. But before giving them the floor, we want to thank our viewers on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter for staying with us today. As usual, we encourage you to send questions to our speakers during the show. And at the end of the session, our guests will try to answer some of your questions. And how can you send your questions? Easy. First of all, you can do it on YouTube by writing your question in our live chat. Also, on Facebook and Twitter, you can comment on this event, post, or tweet. Also, you can send us a direct message. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Marcel Mauri, Vice President and Spokesperson for Omnium Cultural, an organization whose president, Jordi Couchard, is in jail in Spain for having exercised his civil rights. Marcel, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you very much to our speakers for taking time from their busy schedules in very different time zones, ranging from California to Budapest. I'm a university professor of communications, but I am also proud to serve as the vice president of Omnium Cultural. We are an NGO with 185,000 members that was founded during the Franco dictatorship one when it was illegal to speak or publish or teach uh, the Catalan language in public. We began by working much of the time in secret to protect Catalonia's language, culture, and our centuries old public institutions. Over time, we have expanded our remit to also include defending civil and human rights because culture cannot thrive when rights are suffocated. Our president, Jordi Couchard, was officially named a human rights defender by the NGO Frontline Defenders. Sadly, for the last 1,000 days, Jordi has been in prison for having led a peaceful demonstration in 2017. He was held for two years without bail or trial, charged with sedition and rebellion in 2019. He was finally tried by the Spanish Supreme Court and was convicted of sedition, for which he was sentenced to nine years. Last week, Amnesty International once again called for his immediate release and that of a second imprisoned Catalan civil society leader. We have, therefore, devoted a lot of our time recently to issues of democracy and human rights, Unlike everybody else, we are unable to do our usual work directly with people. So, like many others, we have turned our efforts to virtual activities. And last month, we started this series of digital talk about subjects we feel deserve attention and discussion. So today, as you know, we are looking at uh, whether the COVID-19 pandemic is being used to weaken democracy and human rights in Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected all our lives from top to bottom and has tragically killed hundreds of thousands of people, all of ages, races, religions, and in almost every country around the world. Today, we are focusing on how the virus has become an excuse for a growing number, um, number of governments and leaders to roll back rights and freedoms and grab near dictatorial powers ruling by decree with no time limit and putting some of Europe's democracies at serious risk. 
Some governments in Europe have rules blocking immigration, using the virus as an excuse to keep foreigners out, even when many of the essential workers who labor on through the lockdowns in crucial jobs in hospitals, harvesting crops, and caring for our el elderly, they come from distant lands. Racism is on the rise. The rights of refugees, minorities, and women are increasingly threatened. Rather than freedom to speak out and to dissent peacefully, instead leads to arrest. Bulgaria's parliament granted its military the power to restrict the rights of the population. Slovakia and Romania's armies have used force to block movement from Roma communities. Police violence is on the rise in France. We see how democratic norms like a free press and independent judiciary have been blocked in Poland or Hungary. And I just said our, our own president, Jordi Kuchard, has been unjustly in prison and that is largely due to the lack of an independent judiciary at the highest levels in Spain that predated the pandemic. These anti-democratic trends are worrying. There is a real need for a scrutiny and for remediation of the abuses of power and restoration of the rights being denied. The longer the crisis lasts, the more vital it is for citizens to demand an end to the excesses. Thank you for listening. Now, now is the time for the speakers. We hope you all enjoy this webinar. Alex, uh, all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcel. And now we want to introduce David Kay, who will speak to us from California. He is the United Nations Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. He's also clinical professor of law at the University of California, Irvine, on public international law, international humanitarian law, human rights, and international criminal justice. Last year, he published the book Speech Police, the Global Struggle to Govern the Internet. And more recently, he has written the report Disease Pandemics and the Freedom of Opinion and Expression. David, what can you tell us about it? Thanks so much for, for having me today. And, and really, thank you everybody for, for joining us. And uh, thanks especially to, to Sandor and to Renata for being on this panel. I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to, to be here with you. I thought what I would do in just a few minutes, rather than talk specifically about the kinds of threats that people are seeing in different parts of Europe and, and around the world, as I know that Sandor and Renata will, will certainly address, I thought I would try to put this uh, in some uh, framework of international human rights law. And so to do that, let me, let me do a couple of things. First, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what is the human rights law framework in the first place and how can we use it to our benefit in order to challenge attacks on freedom of expression and frankly, attacks on democracy. Uh, I then wanna say a couple of words about the WHO, the World Health Organization's own guidance on what they call risk communication to give us a little bit of a, a public health element, public health and expression element here. And then let me just highlight a few areas where I have uh, perhaps the most concern. So the first thing to mention is that when I'm talking about freedom of opinion and expression, and the kinds of obligations that governments have to protect and to promote free speech. I'm mainly talking about Article 19 of both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article 19 protects everyone's right to hold an opinion without interference. It's an absolute right. Governments cannot restrict that. And it also protects everyone's right to seek receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. That's a robust right. Uh, and it is a right that has been held for decades to be central to democratic life. The ability to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Governments do have the ability to restrict expression. And here's where I wanna emphasize the tool that we have. So governments have the right to restrict expression so long as it meets 
three criteria. It must be provided by law. That is, it must be a pre-existing law. It can't just be the decision of the executive authorities that they want to restrict expression. It can't be so vague that government has total discretion to decide what's legitimate and what's not. And it must be necessary and proportionate in order to protect a legitimate government interest. And one of those interests it includes public health, it could also be national security or the rights or reputations of others uh, and so forth. So if we think about the ability of government to restrict expression, which is narrowly drawn, I think for us, either as scholars or as advocates, what we need to be demanding from governments is that they demonstrate, and it's their responsibility to demonstrate that any restriction is in fact necessary in order to uh, protect, in our circumstance here, public health. That is a tool that we have, demanding that governments meet that obligation. It's not enough for governments simply to assert that it's a public health reason. They have to show that the specific steps that they're taking are necessary and proportionate to achieve that objective. So that's, in general, the framework in which most international human rights lawyers working on freedom of expression deal with. Now, the second point I wanna talk about briefly is the WHO's guidance on communication. Their guidance, which they released actually in 2018, where they famously talked about the rise of what they call infodemics, the possibility of disinformation around uh, public health threats. The guidance that the WHO gives is that it is essential for governments to communicate honestly with people about the nature of the public health threat, the, the disease pandemic in the case of the guidance they were giving, and that they listen as well to the rumors, to the gossip and correct it. It does not talk about criminalizing the dissemination of information. It talks about the importance of government listening to the fears that people have and responding to it. Sometimes those fears, I think naturally, come out in the context of disinformation or misinformation. Sometimes it's fraudulent disinformation and that must be dealt with as well, but not using tools of criminalization because criminalization is what ultimately leads people to resist sharing legitimate information to resist sharing information that others in their communities might need to have, that doctors might need to have, that healthcare workers might need to have. So I think the WHO's guidance on, this, on risk communication actually tracks very nicely the role that human rights also plays as we think about freedom of expression and the intersection with public health. Okay, so with those two frameworks in mind, what are some of the risks, what are some of the the problems that we're starting to see around the world, including in Europe. One, access to information. Governments are making it harder for people to access information about the kind of threat that they face. Oftentimes we expect, and this is certainly true in Europe, we expect government not only to proactively share information, but also when we as citizens or journalists, who are also citizens, seek information Government must have a process for providing that kind of information. And we've seen over the last couple of months that some of those systems are slowing down, sometimes for legitimate reasons, because many people have been working at home, um, but sometimes for illegitimate reasons, for reasons that governments simply don't want to be embarrassed by their failure to, to act. And that, in turn, is an interference with a basic democratic role of accountability. And so one thing that we should be watching is to what extent are governments providing access to information? Secondly, what kind of restrictions are being placed on journalists? Journalists right now provide an absolutely essential way for us to understand the nature of the threat and the role that government is playing in both providing information and in addressing the public health threat itself, again, for reasons of accountability. But we often see around the world and also in Europe, restrictions on journalists being able to do their jobs 
And I think that is another area for us to be, to be looking at. A third area is access to the internet. Now, this may be less acute in Europe, but around the world, we do see restrictions on internet access that have been uh, very serious and problematic because we know that access to the internet is now essential to access information about the public health threat and also to access information about the kinds of steps that government is taking to protect us. And the, the last issue that I want to address, although I'm sure there will be others that we might want to discuss over the course of the hour, uh, is the issue of disinformation. So as I mentioned, the WHO's own guidance is that governments should listen to information and to disinformation and to correct it. Unfortunately, around the world, we've seen efforts to restrict the sharing of information. Now, if that comes in the context of laws prohibiting disinformation, we have to ask, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to say something is disinformation? All too often, the laws move towards criminalization, which ultimately restricts the ability for individuals to share information. This is something that we see both in the context of the traditional media, whether it's broadcast or print, but it's also especially happening in the context of private actors, social media platforms and elsewhere that are, in, are designed to inform us, but are often shaping the information environment in an opaque way that makes it difficult for us to get access to the, to the truthful information and also to the tools to counter disinformation. So I, those are some of the areas that I think are, are important for us to be thinking about, both in the context of the global pandemic and the way that governments in Europe uh, are responding to it. And uh, I'll stop there. I look forward to hearing from Sandor and Renata and to uh, participating in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your contribution and raising these interesting points that I'm pretty sure that our viewers are really interested and they will uh, raise other questions uh, related to them. And now we want to introduce Sandor Lederer, who will speak to us from Hungary. He's the co-founder and director of K-Monitor, an NGO founded to act as an anti-corruption watchdog. Each month, tens of thousands of Hungarians use K-Monitor's dozen plus products to track public budgets and see how money is spent. Sandor Lederer also contributed to the Europe European Commission's anti-corruption report. Sandor, we are following attentively the worrying news from Hungary. Can you tell us how the Hungarian government has used the pandemic as an excuse to curtail human rights? Very briefly, I mean, probably you're familiar with the overall political situation in Hungary, um, basically that we have a government in power for a decade now that managed to, um, well, dissemble um, democratic institutions and move the country further and further away from what we consider a real democracy. Um, and of course, the pandemic was an interesting um, situation for the government to deal with as it had its uh, plans for communication uh, for um, this uh, year already. We, Hungary is gonna, ha gonna have national elections in two years. Um, and we had local election last autumn. I just, I just telling it because it's for the context, I think important. So um, the pandemic came uh, for Prime Minister Orban um, as an as as an um, um, interesting situation because he in general is a person who likes uh, to be the guy who saves the country, who manages a cri crisis. I mean, his um, um, most successful period in his own views, I would say, was when he dealt with uh, um, the refugee issues, uh, with his very radical right-wing uh, politics, or previously when he addressed uh, the economic crisis um, 
with certain economic policies and showing that you know he's the one who protects the Hungarian nation. And of course, this pandemic is again an issue that is a threat for a country, for the whole world, and where strong leaders love to show their uh, power. On the other hand, um, the, the crisis will have um, real uh, effects on the country, not only on the healthcare system, but probably or very likely on the economy. We already see people becoming unemployed um, and, uh, and, 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 and having serious uh, drawbacks. Um, so in this regard, those achievements that Orban considers as his biggest achievements, let's say steady economic growth, low unemployment and the pushback on foreign indebtedness, these are all in danger uh, now because of the consequences of the, of the uh, crisis. So he uses the situation also to prepare uh, to tackle um, these possible consequences. I think that step that they made and that was the most visible uh, abroad was the authorization act that allowed the government to rule by decree for an unlimited period of time uh, without uh, using the parliament for for anything however the parliament was working some of the legislation that was made were made by decree some by the parliament um, although this was uh, the the thing that caused the biggest outcry this wasn't i would say the really serious uh, thing it had a very very bad uh, image and uh, everybody who was scared was uh, had a, had a, a real grounds to be scared because of the 10 years of this government um, but it was just announced that this decree will be withdrawn probably uh, in june um, and the government, as said, could dismantle democracy even without special forces. So this was the most visible part, but let's look a bit behind uh, the, the very um, visible effects of uh, Orban tackling the crisis. I would group the measures uh, that they took um, into two big categories, which have one thing in common. They are all about you know, maintaining or strengthening this government's power. Um, almost every um, legislative step and many, many measures against the pandemic had a political effect as well and a well-planned political effect. So one of these, uh, one of these group is the co total control over information, meaning that the government has, uh, or Orban has daily videos on Facebook action videos where he travels the country, visits uh, hospitals and so on. The, the the operational group of the of the government has a daily news conferences spreading the government's information answering to journalists question which are of course mainly government closed journalists the pro public broadcast is almost only um, spreading the propaganda of the government um, and the, the government really tries to restrict access to information for journalists and citizens so that people are not talking about things they should not talk about. Uh, the freedom of information regime was changed in a way that uh, entities have now 45 days instead of 15 days to answer questions, which can be prolonged for another 45 days, meaning three months. Um, the government also runs extensively ads on Facebook, Google, and something um, you know um, was mentioned by David uh, as well. A criminal punishment was introduced for spreading false news or scaremongering, and there were examples when you know regular Facebook users were taken away by the police for sharing something that by someone was considered as uh, false information. The guy was released, but this is something that can really um, cause self-censorship and of course limit the rights of people. Um, probably this decree will be, or this this uh, amendment, legal amendment will be withdrawn as well. This was heavily criticized and I'm sure it had a very negative effect on, uh, on, on, on democracy. Uh, one other thing, there were, officially there were no demonstrations, but there were demonstrations by cars done in the center of Budapest against Orban. Uh, all the demonstrations uh, uh, were, uh, or many of them were stopped by the by the police, and many were fined by, with very high fines for doing these demonstrations. All limitations, I would say, uh, of freedom of of speech and democratic practices. Now, the other group of measures um, that is relevant is the total control over money and action. 
meaning to limit uh, the competencies of municipalities. This is why I was referring to the municipal elections in, in, in Budapest and in, in, in many districts of Budapest and certain uh, cities outside of Budapest, there are opposition mayors who now need to prove that they are capable of governing, who can govern and who are fit for the elections in 2020. This is the way for them to prove that it's worth voting for them. So the government does everything to show that these guys are unable to, to, to govern. This means taking away competences from local uh, municipalities. That makes taxing, taking away tax incomes of local municipalities, that they are unable to fulfill their uh, duties. Um, industries are taken or can be taken from the jurisdiction of municipalities, meaning that again, tax incomes from big factories go, don't, don't go uh, to, the, to the respective municipalities. And of course, not sharing information with uh, these municipalities so that they have a much harder job um, to, um, to, to fulfill their duties and do their work as they lack uh, crucial information. And now the, the new budget for 2021 20, uh, uh, was introduced, which uh, shows further cuts for municipalities, of course, referring to the, the scarcity caused um, by the pandemic. Um, one last thing, also uh, the, the, party, polit the funds uh, for political parties was halved by the government for, for this year. So in all possible ways, limiting uh, action um, and the possibility for action for the opposition and those who are critical with the government. But despite this, and this is how I would like to finish, um, we saw many examples that citizens, uh, civil society, self-organized groups and also municipalities found their own ways to address the challenges coming from the pandemic and this uh, makes me hopeful that um, the there is Orban's uh, repressive response to the pandemic will not fuel apathy in the country but increase civil self-organization and, uh, and 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 at the end strengthens people uh, um, activities public activities and make them fitter uh, for the period coming uh, after the pandemic thank you thank you sander we hope the same because it's troubling what's happening in hungary and we hope that sooner rather than later hungarians will be able to revert uh, this situation well now is Renata Avila's turn, who will speak to us from Berlin, Germany. She is a Guatemalan international human rights lawyer specializing in the next wave of technological challenges to preserve and advance our rights and better understand the politics of data and their implications of, on trade, democracy and society. She advocates for the right to publish and defends whistleblowers and journalists speaking truth to the power and she recently launched the Progressive International. Today, she will tackle the threats to human rights in Europe as a result of the pandemic management and give us her view about the use of technology to face the new situation. Renata, the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to clarify something. I'm not European, but I see Europe as a model uh, of um, enforcement and enjoyment of high uh, standards of human rights uh, globally, and a model that often sets the uh, the standards and and um, a region that have, have achieved with all the circumstances and what we hear about Hungary and Poland and and lots of abuses here and there, more or less a level of peace and stability and well-being for their citizens that uh, other regions in the world um, aspire to. And that, precisely that, all that Europe has achieved over the last uh, 30 to 40 years is at risk, is at, at, at a very, very dangerous um, moment, um, not only during this crisis, but the day after. And we don't know even about the day after. I am very, very worried uh, because I see an emergence and we saw it in Asia and we, we are seeing this appetite 
of this techno brutalism where the enforcement of conducts on citizens is delegated to systems that are completely unaccountable. And I would say that that's my um, most urgent um, pressing worry. And, um, but also I am very, very worried about the economic, social and cultural rights uh, that agenda of Europeans and not only of Europeans, but of the rest of the world, because if, if, if Europe can get away with it, then everybody will get away with it. And that's uh, a thing that is really worrying me at the moment because um, what we are like, Europe is still at the end of the curve of the infections and at the beginning of the curve of a very damaging discourse that will uh, try to undermine the achievements of workers, the achievements of women rights movement, the achievement of minorities over the last uh, three uh, decades. And that's what um, I'm, the, I'm worried the most about. Why? Because first, uh, there's a series of reasons for that. And the, the, the main reason is that during this period of time, which was not a short period of time, during this like more than 100 days of crisis in Europe, governments had the chance to test systems of surveillance and control, and also to test exceptions that became the rules. And uh, they many liked it. And many can prove many, many uh, success stories in Europe, success stories of uh, controlling a pandemic at a very, very, very high uh, rights cost. And that narrative, that success, that victory narrative, or even uh, it, it can go in two ways. On, on the one hand, it, the countries that manage to control with very strict uh, measures, the crisis will feel more tempted and will gain popular support on using these uh, states of exception again and again and again. Uh, it, it might become a, a common practice, not only justified by a pandemic, but by other circumstances. We have seen that uh, in the fight against terrorism. We might see it now uh, in something that is closer to the fears of people and to the threat to the normal uh, domestic life that, that they, they might have. And that doesn't come alone. I think that things that were not possible before, uh, like heavy, intense, um, unaccountable technology surveillance on workers and on children in schools is going to be possible now. It's going to be possible and justified and even, even gain uh, popular support. And those decisions are taken in a rush. Those structures and infrastructure, uh, it is it, here to stay and improve and get better and better or worse and worse, depending on the perspective that you see it. And that will harm a set of rights that we haven't been prepared to defend. Freedom of expression, we have a very, like I will say, robust vehicle to defend and to activate mechanisms. There's uh, different voices, scholars, and, and, and organizations advocating for it is something that is already in the imaginary uh, of people and uh, is something that it, it is very clear. Uh, but when we, we think of uh, collective rights and the threat to collective rights or to social rights, like the right to, to work, whether you have the right antibodies or the right access to um, uh, an app or a system or um, clearance, uh, those, this, this mediation of your rights uh, through apps, through systems, through heavy surveillance that will monitor your temperature, that will monitor even, uh, even uh, how, how you breathe. This, I would say, are new challenges and the new challenges that it is scary because it it brings us it, it bring the memory and the imaginary of Europe back to a recent very very um, scary history, a history where groups were separated, a history with the rights of some were like completely denied, 
a history that, where the most vulnerable and where the sick and, and the disabled were sacrificed. And that really, really scares me. Uh, the right to protest, of course, it will be disrupted. Of course, if you, if you have this balance that David Kay was, was uh, expressing and you and, and media takes the wrong angle and uh, fear is widespread, then we are losing the public square. But not, we are not only losing the public square, we are also losing the digital public square. Uh, something that is very interesting of this crisis is how social distancing is also becoming digital social distancing because uh, for the sake of preventing the, the wild uh, spread of fake news, we uh, our circles and our ability to outreach and to reach the many and to organize and to launch collective actions also is being constrained. And it's something that is important to reflect about if we cannot go out and we cannot even go out into the digital woods. Freedom of movement. Um, it, it is heartbreaking uh, to see uh, Europe that finally got away with the borders that they wanted to reinstate. As a foreigner in Europe, I can see you how uh, helpless and how uh, this, uh, disturbing for those who are not Europeans is, is, is this uncertainty. And as I see the, this back to normal, is a back to normal based on your passport, based on the privileges of um, uh, whether your health system was responsive or not. And I think that uh, many of the restrictions that uh, Europe wanted to impose on those who come from developing countries or for more uh, from uh, uh, regions that are, uh, hit the worst uh, with the virus, uh, it, 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 it will stay for a long time because there will be no one to advocate for our freedoms. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's something that really, really worries me. Uh, and I think of, um, of this, this um, justification that will be also widespread. And the deterioration of women's rights, that's also a thing that I have seen in my daily life and my daily work. Um, it's not only time, it's not only the extra work that women, and especially mothers, but women in general, are facing at home with the new uh, allocation of uh, tasks and so on everywhere, but it's also a lack of response of a, a targeted response from uh, European countries to warranty the rights and the well-being of women. And uh, last but not least, I'm, I'm also very worried about youth and the perspective of a future and the perspective of uh, environmental rights. Because as we have seen, uh, uh, all the, the past speakers, uh, they uh, focus on restrictions to rights. Now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to unpack a little bit what, what is coming next. And what is coming next is an agenda of economic reactivation that will privilege profit over the rights of people that will cut uh, uh, to a large extent uh, the social agenda. And that is not prioritizing, as we have seen uh, with the first actions of European nations, the, green, the European Green New Deal at all, or the, the, or the future of people, but it's privileged, it's again, saving the banks, saving the airlines, and, and leaving uh, on a shoestring all the social protection systems. So it is, uh, we, we can choose a European future of techno-brutalism and discrimination, and new borders, and new uh, uh, precarious jobs uh, condition on your health, or we can, push now and start decide, designing the positive agenda that we want uh, Europe to adopt. One that not only warranties uh, civil, civic and political rights, but one that warranties also the advancement of economic, social and cultural rights. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Renata, for your contribution. We share your worries and hope that we can overcome all these challenges. Also, we hope that in the near future, Technology will only be used for the good. That said, now is the time to know what our viewers are concerned about. So it's time for our questions and answers.
Well, first of all, we want to thank our viewers for having sent uh, their questions. And as you all can imagine, uh, we won't be able to answer them all. So we've been selecting those which, in our view, are the most uh, representative. Here they are. Mm, the first one is for David K. Professor K, Europe has not really sought ge geopolitical influence in a generation. The US under Trump is abandoning long-standing treaties and alliances and looking inwards, leaving the playing field open for the rise of China. We have seen how China announced the end to Hong Kong's autonomy. The question is, how will this shift in geopolitics affect human rights and democracy in Europe and beyond? David. Thank you. It's a it's a great question. Although I would I would um, I would say that uh, you know while Trump is certainly abandoning treaties and alliances, I mean the 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 pressure that he has been putting on freedom of expression, the kind of disinformation uh, that that his administration, that he in particular, have been have been pushing are, are problems on their own um, internationally and, and domestically here in the United States. But I do think that this is, this is a particular moment for, um, for those in civil society and for those states that um, still believe and are promoting freedom of expression and human rights more generally, not simply to say that the institutions of international governance, in particular, the Human Rights Council, which is the central human rights body of, of the UN system, um, that they are, um, uh, that they're not worth engaging in debate, that they're not worth the fight. In fact, what we need now more than ever is one, access for civil society in those spaces like the Human Rights Council, which is one of the few places in the UN where we can really have active debate and an active presence for civil society. And so I think that on the one hand is important. And on the other hand, or at the same time, it's really important for those states that, um, particularly European democratic states, that they engage in the Human Rights Council, that they um, not accept that simply the Chinese model, whether it's the Chinese model of censorship or of managing the internet or whatever it might be, that that is the model that, that needs to be pursued. In fact, it's the opposite that needs to be pursued. Openness, access to information. And there are states in Europe that are active in the Human Rights Council and they need to be continuing that activity um, and they need to be supported and they need to be also a, um, a kind of conduit for civil society uh, to, to raise its voice in those, in those places. It's not easy. This is a very difficult time. Many governments are uh, claiming that uh, that with with COVID and the pandemic uh, that they have uh, domestic issues that they need to address. Um, but now is really not the time uh, for them to be turning their backs on human rights, and in particular, not to be turning their backs on the normative framework that supports civil society and individuals around the world. And the next question is for uh, Sander Lederer. And it goes this way. Dear Sander, why is the EU so ineffective at reigning in the EU members like Hungary and Poland that clearly violate human rights and therefore EU principles? Um, thank you for the question. Um, it's a relevant one. Definitely. I think there are several reasons. Um, I would point out a few. Um, first of all, unfortunately, there is not such a thing as EU in this regard because, you know, there are several interests within the, within the EU. There are also several decision-making organs within the EU. So it's very hard to talk about the EU as such in, in, in these cases. Um, in the, in, I would say what's uh, important for Hungary and probably also Hol uh, Poland, just in another sense, for Hungary, um, 
I would say Germany has a cru crucial role as the strongest member state and Hungary has good relationship with Ger Germany, especially in an economic sense. Uh, we have several big German car manufacturers here in Hungary. BMW just uh, is just building a new factory. So imagine if they would be so unsatisfied with this country, they wouldn't come here. Uh, so they have their they have their safeguards within this government when it comes to economics. Um, and I think this is um, uh, a dirty deal in a sense that um, until Hungary is, 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 is doing fine in this regard and not causing problems for those big companies, um, be it German, be it American, be it French, whatever, um, that are around, I don't really expect, expect harsh intervention. And then there are also other aspects like, you know, the, the EU is slow with all kinds of decisions, not only these. This is especially an unexplored sphere, how to use Article 7 and so on. So I think there are also procedural um, issues um, in this regard. Also, Hungary, in certain issues, of course, human rights and often very symbolic issues is very anti-democratic, even, you know, in their rhetorics, very anti-European, but it's very pragmatic in a sense that it votes with the EU majority in many crucial questions when it comes to security issues or economic issues, be it free trade. So it is in line with the general neoliberal concept of, you know, um, that is behind uh, the European Union. And again, this helps uh, to achieve compromises in issues that, you know, uh, don't really fit our imaginations of democracy and, and rule of law. And finally, probably there are many who, uh, especially, you know, during Brexit and after Brexit, fear the secession uh, within the European Union and try to find soft ways to deal with member state and believe that you can uh, negotiate with Orban and, and he's a reliable partner in some way. I think these folks make a mistake. Um, but I think these are all reasons that are behind the fact that we did not really see um, a strong European response to those breaches of rule of law that happened uh, in Hungary or Poland. And also as an anti-corruption organization, uh, or a member of an anti-corruption organization, I would say the the massive misuse of public funds and EU funds that happened in this part of Europe, again, that would need uh, intervention, did not really happen. <clears throat> Thanks, Andor. And the next question is for Renata Avila. Dear Renata, you were an early supporter of civic tech using using technology for the public good, and obviously for supporting human rights. And today, as the world faces COVID-19, there is lots of nice talk saying, we are all fighting this together. Yet, isn't technology and social media one of the biggest dividers we have seen in our societies, allowing all kinds of conspiracy theories and fake medical advice and far-right far politics to have a worldwide platform and pushing people dangerously? Well, the, it is a very, very broad uh, question, but that what I would say, like, I'm still very big supporter of civic tech uh, for uh, democracy. One that is controlled by us, one is that, that designed by us, one that uh, where I have the control of my data, where I can audit the algorithm, one that I know that it will not be driven by corporations trying to sell me ads and trying to sell me as as part of their package of services. I think that we need uh, this uh, pandemic is a reflection on how, why do we need public interest technology to serve the purposes of public information, public information channels that we can control, that we can, uh, that uh, where uh, unfiltered information is delivered timely to people and uh, we, we, we can think of, uh, of the model of radio, for example, and public, uh, publicly funded radio. Maybe we should start trying to explore what will be the field. Like, let's put those very complex, like, let's don't see uh, social media as it is now dominated by uh, few companies in two countries 
and, and imposing their values and their governance system uh, on the rest of the world. But well, let's imagine the next phase. And I think that Europe is a very fertile, fertile soil to think what can be. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities now of decentralized, powerful information, communication and organization technologies that can lead us to something else and that can lead us, lead us to somewhere else as well. And I know that it sounds a little bit uh, utopic, and I, it is not like actually the European Commission, even a little drop of money, uh, they drop a little bit of money in the last uh, five years in projects like Decode, uh, where uh, decentralized participatory technologies were pilot. And actually in alliance with municipalities where like uh, there's some experiments, social innovation experiments going on. And they are working, you know, and you don't need a lot of sophistication. You don't need all these flashy things that social media has. Actually, uh, feeding envy, and as many studies uh, show, also leading to health problems in teenagers, depression, and as we have seen, uh, real danger on, on public health with uh, all the anti-vaccines and all these very dangerous discourse circulating there. Let's consider them the past. Let's invent the platforms where we want to build a democratic future. And it will take time, but it's not a lot of time. I think that we can wait. And I think that we can slowly or in a more, uh, at, with the resources and political will and also social will uh, accelerate that, that uh, transition. I, the internet I love and the internet I uh, first met was an internet without social media and we managed. We had chats, we had lots of social interaction and exchange, but we had the keys. Uh, I think that concentrating the keys to the most important channels of uh, uh, public information in times of erosion of democracy in the countries hosting them is, uh, and, uh, and when, in one erosion and the other <laughs> non-existence of democracy, I think that is, uh, is a very dangerous game for Europeans. And I, I know that you can tackle it with, um, um, you know, regulation, uh, antitrust laws, with uh, GDPR and many, many other things. To me, yes, let's do that. But in parallel, let's build something new and ours, principled, uh, uh, people-centric and uh, rights-preserving. Yeah. Thank you, Renata. And now the next question is for David Kay. During the lockdown, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, made a call to release political prisoners for health and security reasons. Spain's Supreme Court instead threatened prison officials with sanctions if they let Catalan political prisoners spend lockdown at their homes, including our president, Jordi Cuixart. What's your view on this matter? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. And, uh, and of course, I think the High Commissioner is absolutely correct here. Um, you know, first off, political prisoners um, oftentimes uh, shouldn't be pr prisoners in the first place. Um, in, and, and this extends not only to, to those described in the question, Catalan political prisoners, for example, but also around the world, there are journalists uh, and political prisoners uh, held uh, in many, many places. And one thing we do know from the World Health Organization and, and other public health authorities is that places of detention are some of the worst places for the spread of the disease. So there's no question that individuals uh, who can be released, uh, who are not in prison for, um, uh, for, for violent crime, uh, and in fact are, are in prison oftentimes uh, for, um, for reasons that are, are really intolerable from the perspective of a rule of law, they should all be released. There's, there's no question about that. And, and I think that applies um, you know, in, in the context of the question in Spain, um, and, but it, it applies in many, many places around the world as well. Thank you, David. Now the next question is for Sander. 
and it goes this way. The trend to authoritarian state nationalism has been constant over years before COVID. What's the way forward? Um, thank you. That's a tough question, of course, um, and I'm not a political analyst, so um, I, I can only give you my personal uh, impression uh, or, or, or uh, thinking on that. Um, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm, I'm not a nationalist, and I think nation states have serious problems and caused serious problems. Uh, I much more believe, you know, in the cooperation of, uh, of countries, and I'm a big fan of the European Union, um, as, as it is, I think, a, a very um, efficient and a very good way of uh, bringing nations together in, in, in a much better way than the nation state. And uh, this is on a higher level and a lower level. I'm a very big fan of municipality, municipalism and the self-organization of uh, citizens as it's in civil society, but all kinds of, you know, um, self types of self-organizations, be it trade unions, be it um, um, collective farms, whatever. So I think um, from the bottom up, we need much more self-organization in communities and strengthening of, of cities uh, and regions around cities. And on the other hand, we need to strengthen um, bigger entities such as the European Union or cooperation in Latin America between Latin American countries instead of, you know, nation states going against each other and trying to prove that one is better than the other. Uh, this leads nowhere and uh, you know we have a very sad story from uh, our uh, neighbors southern neighbors yugoslavia that was a wonderful country as and was torn apart by nationalism and the deadly war uh, so we have a, a real life example from our lives that proved uh, where uh, real nationalism can lead and uh, and this i think should uh, be a wake-up call for those who believe that the solutions for today's challenges lies in nationalism or nationalistic responses. Thank you, Sander. Now the next question is for Renata Avila. Online participatory processes, online participatory budgeting, online voting, these are examples of how technology let us further engage citizens in decision-making processes and thus improve our democratic systems. How can we avoid technophobic reactions due to the misuse of these tools? Uh, by inviting people becoming creators of those tools. I think that when we cannot understand the machine and how it works, Look what it happened with uh, television. And then when everybody had a camera and could start recording and could start like producing their own content. Similarly, I think that with the technologies of today, the more we understand and we more, uh, we, the more uh, citizens are giving the spaces, the resources, the ability of doing things together for their communities and connecting, connecting to each other, the, the better results that we will achieve. It will be very uh, a quick example is what happened what it happened recently with 3D printing and how communities of citizens got together to produce the ventilators that uh, countries uh, affected by COVID uh, uh, were needing. Um, that level of digital social innovation is what I want to see more in the world. Let's not think only on so uh, technology as uh, as social and connecting with my friends, but also contributing for the public good. Okay, thanks Renata. And now we'll, we'll enter to our last round of questions. I'm, I'm gonna ask you if you could um, respond as brief as possible, okay? So uh, the next question is for David Kay. Professor Kay, the UN has various bodies dealing with human rights and regularly issues reports about human rights abuses, but with no power of enforcement, of enforcement, the calls for correction are often ignored by member states. Is there no way to increase pressure on member states who repeatedly abuse human rights and get away with it? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Thank you for, for raising it. 
Um, I mean, there's no way around the fact that um, that the human rights mechanisms of the UN system do not have the formal kind of enforcement power that we expect of of courts or or even the Security Council uh, of the UN, which on its own has been um, has been absent so much in in recent years in in some of the the most serious problems we face. Um, I think that that the question underscores the importance. Um, of, of raising these kinds of human rights abuses, the kind that we're talking about here. Um, you would be surprised perhaps, but many states um, that participate in the Human Rights Council find it extremely embarrassing uh, to be called out. Um, that that you know, old naming and shaming still has a kind of power. Uh, and, it, and it's important because it lays the groundwork for future kinds of efforts that states might take on a bilateral basis, or they might take as the European Union or, or otherwise. So I just wanna urge people to continue to use these forums and to continue to, to call out those governments like Hungary that we've been talking a lot about here today or Poland um, that are um, indeed uh, taking action that is inconsistent with fundamental human rights. Thank you, David. Now, the last question for Sander. Uh, dear Sander, do you think we'll ever see the European Commission proposing to use Article 7 of the EU Treaty to suspend the voting rights of a member state which does not comply with the basic rights enshrined in the treaties? Um, thank you. Hard question. I don't know. I don't really think so. But to be frank, I hope that, you know, these uh, issues can be solved in a way that they don't harm um, the citizens of countries, because often, you know, it's the people who suffer from bad governments. And even those, I think, those Hungarians who voted for this government, which is altogether still a majority of, you know, a minority of Hungarians, they did not vote for them because they're anti-democratic. They have many, many reasons for to vote for uh, such a government, which are not the ones uh, for which uh, we have problems with it. So this is why I would say we have to be careful with these measures and target the government and those who, you know, misuse their power and, and not in a way that, you know, it affects citizens, um, it affects uh, needed developments and so on um, but um, this is why you know I think the whole article 7 procedures shows that we need a much more sophisticated way in the European Union to deal with countries and governments especially that don't uh, respect rule of law and uh, and are highly corrupt and absolutely does not behave in the sense of you know the European values that we all stand for Thanks, Sandor. And now the last question for Renata. Well, you are involved in the creation of the Progressist, Progress, Progressist International. How are European social democratic parties reacting to this new movement? You know, it, it has been, uh, it's interesting. I, I haven't been following the political parties' reactions. I have been uh, following the uh, uh, reactions of new, uh, of uh, young citizens in Europe, across Europe. And that uh, is what I can describe is a lot of enthusiasm, especially for new Euro Europeans, uh, for first generation Europeans, it's a lot of excitement of a Europe, uh, of a, a, a space where uh, we can see the whole picture, the not just transatlantic relationships. Um, we uh, we hope to be a space welcoming all progressive forces and if any social democratic parties embrace and like our principles they're more than welcome uh, that's the idea and but more than parties we want to engage movements that's our aspiration instead of uh, uh, to uh, unite we are more uh, we are more powerful and we can uh, discuss among friends, among people sharing principles, our differences, and come together against this, uh, uh, the nationalist international that is threatening our health, our social care systems, and our democracies around the world. Thanks, Renata. And with this last question, we get to the end of this digital talk. <laughs> we are really thankful to our speakers for having been today with us. 
it's been an honor. We hope that the ideas and thoughts that you have shared with us can be spread and help to preserve and strengthen our democracies and human rights. And of course, we want to thank our viewers for staying again with us. And stay connected with Omni Cultural because next month on the 22nd of June at 4 p.m. CET, we'll have our third digital talk. Will a fractured EU survive the challenges of COVID-19? Do not miss it out. Until then, good night and good luck. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you. you very much.